want you to hit me as hard as you can. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's Who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Howdy, folks. Welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're packing up the car and hitting the road as we embark on a trip to Wally World with the Griswolds. Released almost 40 years ago, 1983's National Lampoon's Vacation stars Chevy Chase as the ultimate over-the-top dad, who is determined to give his family the time of their lives, even if it kills them. Well, up and at him. It's the story of a man who only gets two weeks off a year and overcompensates by giving his family what he thinks they want, being the world's greatest dad. Or die trying. With this being the film that gave Hughes his big break in Hollywood, he was only in the writer's chair while Harold Ramis took on directing duties. Before he was established in Hollywood, Hughes was busy hounding the National Lampoon editors for writing assignments while he worked at the Chicago ad agency. National Lampoon was also hunting for another hit like Animal House after releasing two box office duds, one of which was actually scripted and disowned by John Hughes. In 1979, during the infamous Chicago blizzard, Hughes began developing a short story titled Vacation 58 for the magazine. The idea was simple, a road trip with a few wrong turns. While stuck at home, a snowbound Hughes laid out a road map from the trunk of his car and figured out where his fictional family could stop along the way. Sadly, the story was bumped from the initial vacation-themed issue, which is downright insane. But it was not long before the idea found its way to Hollywood, with producer Matty Simmons bringing the idea to Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was at Paramount at the time. He read it and said, no, it's too episodic. I mean, if they're going from one place to another, it'll never make a movie. Simmons thought that was the whole point. It's a road trip. It's supposed to be episodic. You go from town to town, place to place. But Katzenberg didn't like it and passed on the project. That certainly wouldn't be the last bad decision Katzenberg ever made. So Simmons ended up taking the idea to Warner Brothers, and the rest is history. Okay, so the cast for this film might be its most underrated element. Chevy Chase had made quite a splash as a cast member on Saturday Night Live, and was making his mark on the silver screen with hits like Foul Play, Seems Like Old Times, and the smash success, Caddyshack, which was coincidentally Harold Ramis' directorial debut. According to Ramis, Chevy was perfect for the part and fell into character as the bumbling Clark Griswold instantly. Chase really pulls off some of the best physical comedy ever put on celluloid here. For instance, Clark helping Ellen with the dishes is a great example of one of the many visual character gags, he doesn't wash them off or anything. He simply wipes them and puts the filthy dish away in the cabinet. Chevy can't leave anything alone. If there's a prop in the shot, he will find a way to use it in a bit. My favorite Clark bit is when he gets all the way to the Grand Canyon and looks at it for two seconds. Perfect delivery. Beverly D'Angelo plays Clark's wife, Ellen. D'Angelo is so funny in this role and grounds the entire movie. She's the straight man, uh, woman, to Chevy's bumbling fool. I'm not your ordinary, everyday fool, okay? After reading the script, D'Angelo wasn't immediately sold. She was trying to make it as a more serious actor, and the material didn't pique her interest. Thankfully, her agent convinced her to play the part as Clark's better half. Anthony Michael Hall plays Clark's trusty sidekick, Rusty. Hughes and the crew loved Hall's audition, but they had one condition before hiring him. He needed to keep the braces. Hall really caught Hughes' attention, who was about to make the leap to directing. This would actually be the first of many collaborations between Hall and Hughes, with them going on to make The Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, and Weird Science together. And of course, Dana Barron rounds out the family unit, playing Audrey Griswold. Filling out the rest of the cast was Randy Quaid, who plays the one and only Cousin Eddie. Imogene Coca, who stars as the reviled Aunt Edna, didn't think she could pull off being this mean. Take after take, while screeching at the family in the car, she would ask, Was that too mean? Was that too much? Aunt Edna taking a bite of the dog piece sandwich? That was all Imogene's idea. Oddly enough, it wasn't the film's crude humor that gave her pause, but rather the idea of having to film scenes inside a moving vehicle as Coca was terrified of car travel due to an accident she and her husband were involved in. 
Thankfully, she overcame her fear to play the role. Jane Krakowski made her feature debut as Cousin Vicky, who introduces Audrey to marijuana. John P. Navin Jr. plays Cousin Dale, and he introduces something uh, a little different to Rusty. Did you have a bop your bologna? A cool tidbit about the actor, he delivered the very first line in Cheers, presenting Sam with a fake ID and claiming he was a Vietnam vet. Out of bed, Chief. <laughs> and of course, Christy Brinkley plays the gorgeous woman who keeps crossing paths with Clark. Since she was a famous model, everyone assumed she would be comfortable in front of a film camera, but she was actually very nervous. It probably doesn't help that the producers were trying to pressure her into appearing nude for the film. For someone who never acted before, I think she did an amazing job in her brief role. The famous vaudeville actor Eddie Bracken plays the park's tycoon Roy Wally. Younger viewers may recognize him from Home Alone 2, where he plays the benevolent toy store owner, Mr. Duncan. John Candy was an 11th hour addition to the cast, the reason why we'll get into later, and plays one of the Wally World security guards. Like everyone else with a sense of humor, Hughes loved working with Candy on this film. It wasn't until 1987's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles that the two would work together again, which followed a streak of collaborations, The Great Outdoors, Uncle Buck, Home Alone, and Career Opportunities. Candy and Ramis also shared a previous friendship, performing together at Chicago's Second City Comedy Troupe. In fact, Ramis features a lot of Second City alumni in this film. Eugene Levy makes a cameo as the used car salesman who pulls the old bait-and-switch routine on Clark, Brian Doyle Murray as the Camp Comfort Clerk with a camp that doesn't quite live up to that name. Cousin Eddie's wife, Cousin Catherine, played by Miriam Flynn, who was also in Hugh's first film, National Lampoon's Class Reunion. And that baby was played by Hayden Christensen? Just kidding. Harold Ramis has a couple of off-screen cameos as one of the police officers in the third act and the recorded message from Marty the Moose. Sorry! <laughs> That car. Yeah, huh? that's the family truckster. Boy, she's a beauty. Like those green walls. Once the writing was complete, filming officially started in July 1982 and lasted 55 days. John Hughes' script took the Griswolds through the South originally, but Ramis thought those states were a little too barren. So instead, he changed it to the beautiful landscapes of the American West. True to the spirit of the film, it was shot all over the country. Arizona, California, Missouri, and Colorado. The actors were essentially living the movie themselves, moving a huge 300-foot caravan of cast and crew vehicles from one location after another, like one big traveling circus. It was a thousand-mile odyssey and a logistical nightmare to complete this movie. You see, before vacation, most Hollywood road movies were made on back lots. Ramis wanted to film on location, so production had to navigate challenges like filming on actual moving cars. The production was also constantly at the mercy of weather and mother nature. And this was a time before cell phones and email, so they had to make sure they didn't leave anyone behind, which happened occasionally. In the original short story, the point of view was actually from Rusty, as Hughes was clearly more interested in the teenage condition demonstrated by his later output. So yeah, that means supermodel Christy Brinkley would have been flirting with teenage Rusty throughout the film. Yikes. Once Chevy was cast, Ramis thought the perspective needed to shift to Clark because no team would be more interesting than Chevy Chase's antics. Also in Hugh's original story, the theme park was none other than Disneyland, but obviously, that wasn't going to fly since Disney was never going to consent to the R-rated material. So to avoid any legal issues, all of the names associated with Disneyland were altered. The park became Wally World and its mascot, Marty Moose, is very reminiscent of another animal mascot. Not only that, but Roy Wally's appearance is strikingly similar to Walt Disney himself and shares a name with Walt's brother. The actual shooting locations for the Wally World theme park were Santa Anita Park and Six Flags Magic Mountain, both in California. To film the ending roller coaster sequences, the cast had to ride it repeatedly for at least seven or eight times. In fact, Dana Barron was so plagued with motion sickness during these scenes, she had to take medication and pass out on a bench between takes. Her expression says it all. Hello, darkness, my old friend. The Griswold's Chariot, the Wagging Queen family truckster, was custom created for the film, similar to the Ferrari in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Custom built by famous auto designer George Barris. The look is based on a 1979 Ford LTD Country Squire, and it was supposed to mock American cars of the late 70s. 
In total, there were about five cars made for this production. The Truckster features a metallic pea green paint scheme, extensive imitation wood panel and decals, eight headlights, a grill area largely covered by bodywork with only two small openings close to the bumper, an oddly placed fuel filler door, and my personal favorite touch, an airbag made from a trash can liner. It was by design to be as unattractive as possible, and it worked a little too well. Following the film's release, station wagon sales plummeted, and models were shortly replaced in popularity by minivans and later SUVs. In the scene at the gas station where Clark looks for a fuel tank and throws the license plate, Chase was very worried that he was accidentally going to take that woman's head off. Yeah, that close call was not planned. Also, to combat the intense heat of the summer-long trek, enormous air conditioners help keep the car cool for the actors. Remember that morbid gag when the family forgets that Aunt Edna's dog is still tied to the bumper of the truckster as they drive away? Ramis reveals that the crew actually saved the dog from suffering the same fate when they stopped the driver with the dog still attached to the bumper. Pour one out for my man Dinky though. Poor little guy. While the National Lampoon was known for its harder edge and cruel humor, Harold Ramis admitted that he's not proud of the scene where the Griswold family gets lost in East St. Louis and have their hubcaps stolen by locals. He said it dehumanized everyone involved, and if he could go back, he would not shoot the scene, at least not in its current state. At the time, he was willing to push the envelope further for the lampoon. Oh, and the film's entire ending was also changed. Production originally filmed a whole sequence where Clark snaps and takes Roy Wally and Wally World executives hostage, shoots Wally in the leg, and makes them sing and dance to get his money's worth of entertainment before being taken to jail. Apparently, test audiences loved the movie, up until that moment. The crew concluded that the payoff of the movie needed to be at Wally World since the audience had invested over an hour waiting to get there. So Hughes wrote a new ending where Clark hijacks the park instead and delivered on the promise of a day at Wally World. It was also done before CGI, so Wally World's entrance was actually a matte painting optically inserted into the frame. The new ending, shot four months after principal photography wrapped, saved the movie. You can tell it was shot much later based on Anthony Michael Hall's height change. Funny enough, Hall was actually supposed to be the younger brother, but since he was going through puberty and ends the film three inches taller than when it started, they changed the dynamic around so he would be the older brother. The original ending was later used in Christmas Vacation when Cousin Eddie kidnaps Clark's boss, also played by Brian Doyle Murray, and drags him to the Griswold home. Allegedly, Chevy Chase still has the original ending on tape, but so far, it's never been publicly released. Can I do your back, honey? I've already done my back. Can I do your front? Go do your own front. With the new ending now in place, the film was released on July 29, 1983. It came in at first place at the domestic box office during its opening weekend, raking in over $8 million before going on to gross a total of $61 million. It even beat Jaws 3D and Return of the Jedi during its opening weekend, which, to be fair, those films had already been out for a while at that time. When it was first released, critics panned it while audiences went crazy for it. It also came out the same year as another Hughes Penn film, Mr. Mom, starring Michael Keaton, and that one actually proved to be more successful at the box office. Obviously, with any classic John Hughes film, the soundtrack is a work of art unto itself. The score was composed by Ralph Burns, and the soundtrack featured original songs by Lindsey Buckingham of Fleetwood Mac fame. While the soundtrack did not make the charts, Buckingham's single, Holiday Road, reached number 82 on the Billboard Hot 100. Holiday Road. Of course, the rest of the soundtrack is also pretty terrific. Blitzkrieg Bop by the Ramones, Little Boy Sweet by June Pointer, I'm so excited by the Pointer Sisters. And Buckingham's Dancing Across the USA plays the film out. Something to note, the music in the Christy Brinkley scene is different depending on which version of the movie you're watching. In the original theatrical release, the song featured was I'm So Excited by the Pointer Sisters, which is how everyone remembers it. But on home release, the song was changed to Little Boy Sweet by one of the Pointer sisters, June Pointer. This is most likely due to a rights issue, and the only time you can catch the film with its original song is when shown on TV. 
And naturally, Hughes even gets a writing credit on the Wally World theme song. Moose is moose, we know. Marty Moose. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, kids. Oh, kids. Mm-hmm. Waitress. As a result of the film's massive success, a franchise was born and spawned five sequels of varying quality. European Vacation has its moments, but it's pretty... weird. Director Harold Ramis and star Anthony Michael Hall both declined to return for the sequel, opting instead to work on Ghostbusters and Weird Science respectively. Producer Maddie Simmons initially told Dana Barron that she would be returning to the role of Audrey, but once Hall declined to reprise his role, the new director, Amy Heckerling, requested both children be recast. To say Chase and Heckerling did not get along well during production would be an understatement. Amy Heckerling once said she disliked Chase so much she refused to step on set unless she had a plane ticket to New York City in her hand so that she could leave any time she wanted. Other cast members felt differently towards Chase, with Eric Idle really enjoying working with the actor. Reportedly, after filming Wrapped, Eric Idle and Chase began working on a screenplay for a follow-up called National Lampoon's Australian Vacation. Aside from a few shark-related gags, neither could come up with much and the project was scrapped. While Hughes is credited as one of the writers, he was not involved with this film. In fact, he had no idea they were coming out with a sequel until he saw a preview of it on television. The screenplay was written almost entirely by Robert Klein, the screenwriter behind Weekend at Bernie's and Weekend at Bernie's 2. Klein was asked to incorporate unused elements from Hughes' script for the first film, resulting in Hughes being awarded a writing credit by the WGA. Currently, there's an HBO Max series in development called The Griswolds, with Johnny Galecki, the Rusty from Christmas Vacation, on board as producer. The project is said to be about what happens when the disaster-prone family returns home from vacation and explores their daily lives in the suburbs of Chicago. At the time of writing this, it's unclear if any of the other cast members will return. Christmas Vacation is still entertaining, thanks to Hughes actually being back in the writer's chair for this one. Dinner was full! Christmas Vacation originally had none other than Chris Columbus directing until he had an awful dinner with star Chevy Chase, who treated him like crap. Columbus asked to be let go from the project, and Hughes felt so bad about the whole thing that he offered him another holiday comedy he wrote, a little movie called Home Alone. Not nah, a bad consolation prize. Vegas Vacation only exists so Chase could escape his contractual obligation to Warner Brothers and avoid a potential lawsuit. And there was also a made-for-TV movie called Christmas Vacation 2, Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure, which featured the return of the original Audrey Griswold, played by Dana Barron. I'm gonna kill myself. Honestly, the less said about that movie, the better. In 2010, a short film called Hotel Hell Vacation was released as part of a campaign for a travel rental website. That short was the first time since 1997's Vegas Vacation that Chase and D'Angelo reprised their iconic roles. Not gonna lie, it's pretty terrible since it's one giant half-baked ad. But if you really love these characters, maybe you'll find it more amusing. In 2015, Warner Brothers hit the button on a soft reboot of the franchise with Vacation, starring Ed Helms as an adult Rusty Griswold trying to take his family on a trip to Wally World before it closes forever. Chase and D'Angelo also return for a scene in that film. Also, in 2011, Chase stated he was writing his own sequel. The idea would be basically Swiss Family Griswold, where it starts on a cruise and ends on a deserted island. Sorry, Chevy. Seems like Cousin Abby already beat you to the punch. Of course, it wouldn't be a Hughes film without Chicago appearing somehow, which is where the Griswold family resides. Harold Ramis also grew up in Chicago, so him and Hughes were a match made in heaven. It's a shame that this was their only collaboration, as I would have loved to see what else they could have teamed up on. And while speaking about Harold Ramis, I would be remiss not to include some of his notable works. Animal House, Meatballs, Caddyshack, Stripes, Ghostbusters, just to name a few. He also wrote, directed, and produced what I consider to be his magnum opus, Groundhog Day. Similar to Hughes, Ramis also suffered an untimely death at the age of 69 in 2014. The official poster by fantasy artist Boris Vallejo is actually really, really brilliant. It's the perfect window into Clark's mind and how he views himself to his family. This ripped hero going to any lengths to make sure his family has a great vacation. This film was what put Hughes on the map in Hollywood, no pun intended, as within a year of the film's release, he was in the director's chair for 16 Candles, 
That's no small feat, especially when we consider that this was only his second screenplay produced, the first having been the disastrous National Lampoon's class reunion. As someone who has taken a cross-country road trip to Los Angeles himself, I can see why this film connected with audiences. If you've ever taken a road trip anywhere, we all have a horror story or two to share. Beyond just that, we can also identify with either all or some members of the Griswold clan. The dynamics just ring true. When the kids put on their headphones to tune out their parents' cringy music, I felt that. Clark isn't particularly a good person or a good husband, but we see enough of ourselves in him, especially during that incredible third act profanity lay speech. Well, I'll tell you something, this is no longer a vacation. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. <laughs> People can definitely relate to family driving you crazy. So what's the moral of the story? The next time you're thinking about going on epic cross-country road trip with your family, fly, don't drive. Ultimately, I give National Lampoon's Vacation four out of five family trucksters. And if you like what you're watching, make sure you subscribe to Joe Blow Videos, hit that bell to receive all notifications. We're an independent company and we appreciate your support. Thanks for watching.